I am really delighted to be able to introduce uh, a dear uh, an old friend to the store tonight. It's one of the the best parts of being the owners is when people that we know and really like have not are not only here to talk about their books, but are here to talk about really good books. So it's kind of a, a win, win, win all the way around. And um, as obviously many of you know, since you're related to him or neighbors of, of Randy's, he uh, he is a local. He grew up in Washington, went to high school up the street at St. Albans. And while we would like to claim him as our own here at PNP, the truth is that after clerking for Thurgood Marshall, he spent most of his time in the halls of academe at Harvard, where he's currently the Michael R. Klein Professor of Law. Randy is also uh, a prolific writer of books. He's written, is this the sixth or the fifth? This is the sixth. Okay, he's written five previous books, most of them dealing with race in America, always challenging the conventional wisdom and always forcing a new or renewed conversation about issues that many people find vexing or too sensitive to address. His new book, it's called For Discrimination, Race, Affirmative Action, and the Law, ref reflects the same spirit of intellectual inqu inquiry and moral passion that has marked uh, his earlier works. And since its publication earlier this year, and this is really no surprise, it's gotten rave reviews from a variety of critics uh, with good reason. I hope, uh, as I said earlier, I hope you will not only buy it, I hope you will read it. Um, I hope you'll buy copies for your friends, and I especially hope that some of those friends are people in Congress and on the bench who will gain some much-needed insight from what Randy has to say. Anyway, I will let Randy talk uh, in more detail about the specific arguments in his book, but I just do want to tell one quick story about him. Um, Randy and I were in graduate school together. We met very early on in our graduate school careers, and uh, we bonded over many things, but um, we had some really interesting discussions, and I, I don't know why this really stands out for me, but Randy had just finished working on his senior thesis at Princeton, and he had taken on a subject for that thesis that was the work of a very famous uh, historian who, who, who he had been very inspired by in his own undergraduate career. And so he took on this topic, and in the course of delving very deeply into it, writing his senior thesis, he discovered that he didn't actually agree as much as he had expected to with this historian, and um, you know, which is, you know, can be somewhat unnerving, right? So he wrote the thesis honestly, and he had revised his views. And in the end, this thesis was not exactly flattering to this historical icon that he was writing about, and it ruffled some feathers, to say the least. And I think that many would try to then dismiss this as the work of an overzealous young scholar who's just attempting to to sort of revise history. But it really was far from that. And I think the reason that I think about this is that it really says a lot about the way Randy has gone on in his career to tackle virtually every issue he's confronted and tried to study. Um, it tells us a lot about why his teaching and scholarship and writing is so important um, to what happens in classrooms and editorial bo boardrooms and courtrooms across this country. Um, Although he frequently challenges established views, he is not simply a contrarian. I would say he is a true public intellectual. And if we consider the political gridlock in this town right now and the high decibel hyperbole that too often passes for civic discourse, it's this kind of work that um, really forces us to stop and reflect and consider and try to understand the ways that laws and court cases and political and ideological currents do or don't reflect our values as Americans and how they shape our lives. Um, and then finally, and probably most importantly, he's just a really great, nice guy. And I am proud to call him my friend, and I'm really proud to have him here. So welcome, Randy Kennedy. Well, thanks so much for the um, gracious introduction, and thanks even more for providing this space to me and to all of us, this bookstore is really a great cultural contribution and uh, it makes a real difference not only in uh, Washington DC but nationally and so thank you. I'm going to speak for a few minutes about um, my book for discrimination and then um, the floor will be open to uh, comments to questions and by all means to objections, because this is a subject about which people disagree. And I would suspect that in an, in an audience like this, there will probably be disagreement. So my book is for discrimination. It's about the affirmative action controversy. And um, 
in the book, I really push two central points. One is a point having to do with the legal status of affirmative action, and the other has to do with the question of whether affirmative action is wise. So first, the, the legal point. Uh, the Supreme Court of the United States has affirmative action cases on its docket this year. It had affirmative action cases on its docket last year. It'll have affirmative action cases on its docket in the years to come. Um, in my view, the uh, legal fight over affirmative action is one in which the Supreme Court of the United States has um, done very poorly in terms of its jurisprudence. Um, affirmative action, by affirmative action, what I'm really t I'm talking about, uh, any effort to um, reach out a, a helping hand uh, to people affiliated with a given group. Uh, affirmative action comes in all sorts of guises. Uh, I mainly focus on affirmative action in higher education. Um, there's all sorts of different types of affirmative action. You can have light affirmative action. Let's suppose that you have a, a college, uh, um, you're, you're admitting people to college, you have 100 seats, you get down to that last seat, and you have two people. Let's suppose it's a white Anglo, and let's suppose it's a Latino student. They're both, they, they have essentially equal records, but you prefer under those circumstances the Latino student because let's say there haven't been many Latino students at the school. Okay, that's a light version of affirmative action, and frankly that version of affirmative action doesn't cause all that much controversy. Let me give you another version of affirmative action, the sort that gives rise to a considerable amount of a controversy. Let's suppose, again, that we're talking about a college uh, class. You're admitting a college class. And let's suppose that you prefer black students who have records in terms of uh, standardized test scores, in terms of uh, uh, um, grades. Let's suppose that you prefer the black student, a black student over a white student, even though uh, the white student's record is demonstrably stronger. That's a stronger form of affirmative action, and it's that form of affirmative action that's given rise to uh, the most controversy. So the point is there's lots of different sorts of affirmative action, um, but with respect to, frankly, both versions, I don't think that there should be uh, a, a legal problem, at least insofar as the federal constitution is concerned. Um, the United States Constitution, the 14th Amendment, the part of the constitution most pertinent to this controversy, the 14th Amendment uh, prohibits uh, states from um, uh, withholding from anyone the equal protection of the law. So the question becomes, well, What's a violation of the equal protection of the law? Uh, the Supreme Court has struggled with this over the years. It seems to me that um, the equal protection of the law is violated in racial terms whenever any public authority invidiously discriminates against a person or group. What do I mean by invidiously discriminate? I mean, if, the, if a public authority makes a decision or promulgates a policy that is aimed at putting a group down, is aimed at sh suggesting that the group is inferior, is aimed at humiliating the group, is aimed at subordinating the group. That is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. That is an instance of invidious discrimination. Question, is affirmative action, as it is characteristically practiced in the United States, does it fit that profile? And the answer, it seems to me, clearly no. Um, when the University of Texas, for instance, has an affirmative action plan in which it reaches out a helping hand to Latinos, reaches out a helping hand to black students, and in so doing, in so doing, um, to some degree limits the opportunities of white students or white applicants to the University of Texas, is the University of Texas trying to put down white students who are to some degree disadvantaged? Are they trying to put, is the, is the University of Texas trying to put down those students because they're white? 
Is the University of Texas trying to say that white people are inferior? Is the University of Texas trying to stigmatize those would-be students at the University of Texas? The answer is clearly not. Most of the students at the University of Texas are white, after all. The great majority of people in positions of authority at the University of Texas are white. The reason why the University of Texas has an affirmative action plan is to seek to, um, well, it, it, the variety of reasons, the ones that they, the University of Texas mainly trumpets is the University of Texas wants to create diversity so that people at the University of Texas can better learn from one another. That's one of the rationales for affirmative action. But it's not to put down white people, and to that extent, and it's because there is an absence of any sense of animus against whites. It's for that reason that it seems to me that people like the young woman who sued the University of Texas in the case last year at the, at the Supreme Court, Fisher versus the University of Texas, it's for that reason that it seems to me that plaintiffs in these, ca in these cases really do not have a good legal argument. They are not the victims of invidious reverse discrimination. Are they being disadvantaged? Yes, they are being disadvantaged. That's true. But they're being disadvantaged for a reason that is a good reason. And to the extent that they are being asked to sacrifice, uh, they are being asked to sacrifice in favor of a mission that, uh, frankly, all Americans should participate in, and that is overcoming our history of racial oppression. So on the legal matter, I, I, frankly, I think that the Supreme Court has misled us, and uh, I spend a good amount of time uh, discussing this. Um, one, the Supreme Court makes it seem as though one cannot distinguish clearly between um, uh, positive discrimination and negative discrimination, between malign discrimination and benign discrimination. One of the people who is most vociferous with respect to this is the person at the Supreme Court who most dislikes affirmative action, and that's Clarence Thomas. And uh, Justice Thomas says over and over again that, you know, all discrimination is bad. And he says, you know, uh, uh, you, you really can't distinguish between malign discrimination and benign discrimination. Well, we can, go into, we can go into this further in question and answer if you want, but I'll just say one thing right here. Let's just, I ask you, I'll put a, two signs, two signs. Sign number one says, colored people welcome. Sign number two says, colored people unwelcome. Well, both of those signs have a racial distinction in them. Both of those signs make reference to people of color. I can easily distinguish between those two signs, and it seems to me that the Supreme Court of the United States and the legal culture of the United States should be able to distinguish between those two. The second thing that I uh, talk about uh, in my book has to do with the uh, policy dispute over affirmative action. And this, I think, is a closer question. This, I think, is a closer question. Um, there are, I think, good justifications for affirmative action. The one that has gotten the most attention lately, especially for talking about higher education, is the so-called diversity rationale, the pedagogical hunch that better learning will take place if you have classrooms, if you have campuses in which people from all sorts of areas, all sorts of different ideological positions, all sorts of different races come together. The idea being that people can learn from one another. They can learn from different perspectives. They can learn from different experiences. That's the one rationale that the Supreme Court of the United States will allow us to talk about with respect to affirmative action in higher education. I think we should be able to talk about other things. I think that the uh, diversity rationale is good, perfectly plausible. Frankly, I think there, there are other more powerful ra rationales for affirmative action. Um, one is the idea of compensatory justice, the idea of rectification, the idea of reparations. 
um, the idea that public authorities ought to be able to advance the interests of groups who still bear the scars of past racial mistreatment. People talk all the time about the various gaps between Latino students, black students, and white students. It's a cliche. Everybody knows about these gaps. Well, where do these gaps come from? As far as I'm concerned, these gaps are the scars of past racial mistreatment. Uh, it wasn't so long ago that um, racial minorities were completely, completely excluded from schools in the United States. I mean, I'm not all that old. I was born in 1954. I'm 59 years old. I saw the end of Jim Crow segregation. And that's in my lifetime. And then my mother, my dear mother, who's right there, <laughs> she lived a 10-minute walk from the University of South Carolina. 10-minute walk. Could she go to the University of South Carolina? Absolutely not. Black people could not go to the University of South Carolina, so she went to South Carolina State College, got a good education, but was she deprived in terms of her human capital? Yes, and she was lucky. She went, to, you know, she went to college. There are a lot of other black people who were deprived in a much more telling way. And when you're deprived of education, when you're deprived of social networks, if, when you're deprived of experiences, the deprivation doesn't just stick with you. You have children, you have relatives. If you're deprived, the deprivation is perpetuated. And we are still in a society in which we're still facing the perpetuation of past discrimination. To intervene against that is a good justification for affirmative action. The Supreme Court of the United States has said, has essentially ruled that out of order, but they're wrong. There are other justifications for affirmative action. I'll just mention one. We all know that racial discrimination is abroad in our land. We know it from studies that have been done with respect to the housing market. We know it with studies that have been done with respect to education, employment, the administration of criminal justice. The fact of the matter is that um, uh, racism is an invisible wind. It's there. True, there are all sorts of laws that prohibit racial discrimination, but it's also true that these laws are notoriously under-enforced. One justification for affirmative action is to counter this invisible wind that we know is there. Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, the only president who has devoted a major address to defending affirmative action, in his address, that was the principal, that was his principal justification for affirming affirmative action, and it is a good one. Now, are there costs for affirmative action? The answer is yes. Yes. Affirmative action is no different than any other social policy. Any social policy is going to have costs associated with it. Affirmative action is no different. I'll mention just a couple of these costs. So one, the stigmatizing costs of affirmative action. Uh, critics of affirmative action say that one problem with affirmative action is that it, it sort of puts a, a cloud over beneficiaries of affirmative action. Onlookers say, well, um, this person has a good record, but I'm going to, I'm going to devalue the record a bit because I know that this person, or I, I, I suspect, or it's likely that this person has uh, gotten a boost from affirmative action. Is that real? Yes, that's real. Sure, that's real. 
three weeks, uh, I, guess, I guess it was about a month ago. A month ago, I began my 29th year as a teacher at Harvard Law School. I began it with my contracts class. 80 students, very smart students, very hard charging students, very ambitious. They're there, first day. I go to the front of the class, I introduce myself. You're here for contracts, I'm Randy Kennedy. I know, I'm sure that there are some students, and we can get a little bit of an empirical test because I'm really happy to see that there's some students here in this gathering. We can sort of test this one out. It's good to see you all here. Thank you for coming. I bet that there are some students who on that very first day say, do I have a real Harvard Law School professor? <laughs> or do I have, you know, a good but somewhat lesser affirmative action Harvard Law School professor? Well, you know, that's a cost. That's a cost for them, it's a cost for me, that's a cost. Is it a real cost? Yes, it's there. Sure, it's there. There are other costs. Um, affirmative action has been a subject about which there's been a, a lot of um, debate, a lot of conflict, a lot of people feel resentment. A lot of people feel resentment. I certainly have white friends who have been disappointed here or there with respect to you know, trying to get a job or trying to get admission to some place. They're disappointed, they worked really hard, they didn't get it. They see a person of color who did get it. They feel resentment. That's a cost. It's a cost that has affected our politics. So affirmative action, and, and there are other costs. And again, in question and answer, we can talk about other costs if you want to. So affirmative action does have costs. Um, in my view, the benefits over the past four decades have clearly outweighed the costs. But, you know, you, you can have a real debate about that. There are people whom I respect a great deal who measure these things differently. And their cost-benefit calculation takes them the other way. So I think as a policy matter, I think it's a, it's a closer question. As a legal matter, I don't even think it should be a, uh, a close uh, question. Well, I think that's enough for now. Why don't we, uh, I'll subside and let's turn the uh, monologue into a dialogue. The floor is open to questions, comments, objections. If I don't get questions right away, I'll start asking questions. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. Hi, um, Charles Quincy Tiger. Um, where did this construct come from uh, where if you have to prove invidious discrimination if you're a minority, yet if you're white, you would just have to show that there's some ill effect on you? I mean, is that the construct that's really going on legally, or is that kind of a social thing? No, that's not what's, no, no. Um, the way, I mean, under, under you know, existing doctrine, um, you have to show that a, any racial distinction that the government uses, that, a, that the government uses, is presumed to be illicit, no matter what. So for instance, um, so the, 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 the white person, Fisher, sh her claim was, well, there's a racial distinction. The University of Texas uh, has an affirmative action plan. Uh, they say openly that they take race into account. So whenever race is taken into account, uh, the Supreme Court says that distinction is presumably illicit. It is presumably illegal. The only way that you can justify it is to justify it you have to give super duper good reasons for it. The Supreme Court has its doctrine of strict scrutiny. It is presumed to be wrongful. 
unless you can show a compelling justification. Now, what I was saying is that um, I think it's a mistake to say that all racial distinctions are presumptively illicit. It seems to me that um, uh, invidious racial distinctions are illicit, but the sort of racial distinction that is in play in affirmative action should not be viewed as uh, you know, presumptively uh, illicit. Does that answer the question? Okay. Others? Yes, sir. Sure. So, sure. The, the, the question had to do with um, a, a case decided a number of years ago stemming from the university, coming from the University of Michigan. Actually, there were two cases. A number of years ago, um, there, were, there were two cases. One case was against the um, uh, undergraduate admissions at the University of Michigan, uh, Gratz versus the University of Michigan. And the companion case was a case called Grutter versus the University of Michigan. And the Grutter case uh, was a case against the University of Michigan Law School. Um, the person, and, and it, was a, it was one of these cases, it was a split decision. The Supreme Court of the United States said that the affirmative action plan that was in, uh, put in place by the, univers the, the undergraduate plan, the Supreme Court struck down. Uh, the Supreme Court upheld the affirmative action plan with respect to the University of Michigan Law School. Now, we can get into the, you know, the, the doctrinal issue if you want. I think the most interesting thing about the University of Michigan case has to do with the person who wrote it. The person who wrote the Grutter case, and it was, it's the key case, it is the case that is the leading um, uh, precedent upholding affirmative action in higher education. That case, 5-4, very thin margin, that case was written by uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. And one of the things that's sort of interesting is that prior to that case, Sandra Day O'Connor had always voted against affirmative action. And so a lot of people were very surprised that she wrote the case that upheld affirmative action. I mean, she became the savior of affirmative action. She stepped into the shoes of Lewis Powell. Lewis Powell in 1978 was the savior of affirmative action in that case, Bakke case. Forward 20 years, Sandra Day O'Connor, Goldwater Republican, writes the case. And it's her vote that keeps racial affirmative action afloat in higher education. Now, the one thing about that I think is really interesting about the Sandra Day O'Connor vote and what makes her vote sort of poetic justice, let's go back and recall who it was that appointed Sandra Day O'Connor. The person who appointed Sandra Day O'Connor was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, when he was running for president, by the way, said he was against affirmative action. When he was running, he was against affirmative action. When he was president, he was against, against affirmative action. He's running for president. What does he say? He says, if I'm elected president of the United States and I get a chance to put somebody on the Supreme Court, I promise that I will put a woman on the Supreme Court. <laughs> I will find the best woman jurist I can, and that person will go on the Supreme Court. I will give, now, you know, I'm an ideological opponent of Ronald Reagan's, but I will give him credit. He carried through on his promise. He carried through on his promise. He gets elected president, vacancy comes, Sandra Day O'Connor. Now, at the time, by the way, at the time, there were people who said, this was affirmative action. And it was, it was. And here's the thing about affirmative action that I think is a, is a point. One of the reasons why I think affirmative action is going to be around for a good long time, regardless of what the Supreme Court of the United States says, I mean, I think what the Supreme Court of the United States is, says is important, but the Supreme Court doesn't end the conversation. 
And if the Supreme Court was to strike down racial affirmative action, it would continue. Why would it continue? Because the affirmative action ethos is deep in our society. In fact, even people who say they're against affirmative action, when you really push them, they're not. Ronald Reagan, I did, there's an example. I'll give you another example. Every cabinet since, every presidential cabinet since Lyndon Johnson's has been subject to a quota. People don't like the term quota. You say quota, people start shaking, nervous, nervous, nervous. Every cabinet since Lyndon Johnson has had at least one black person in it. Is that accidental? That's not accidental. That's not accidental. If Patrick Buchanan perished the thought, if Patrick Buchanan had become president of the United States, there would have been a black person in Patrick Buchanan's cabinet. Why? Because no matter where you are in the American ideological spectrum, no matter where you are with respect to the affirmative action issue, no matter how conservative you are, you feel, you know, it simply would not be right to have a racially homogeneous cabinet. You just wouldn't, you know, just, it, would, it would seem just intolerable. That's good. That's a good thing. Now, you know, I mean, I'm not saying it's not, you know, it's, it's not heaven on earth. It's not the revolution. <clears throat> but given where we're coming from, that is a real step forward, and that's true. Um, another example, the Republican Party. The Republican Party, you know, every four years, the Republican Party nominates somebody for president. Uh, the Republican Party, every four years, has a, plat you know, in their, in, their, in their party platform, they attack affirmative action. But then you take a look at the uh, convention. If you just took a look at the Republican Party and just you, if you didn't know anything and you just looked at the television coverage, you'd say, oh my goodness, oh, there's a lot of racial diversity with respect to the Republican Party. I mean, look at the people who they have speak. That's because, that's because the Republican Party actually feels anxious. They feel vulnerable at having a Republican Party that is as white as the Republican Party is. Um, a number of years ago, I was invited to a um, conservative think tank, the Manhattan Institute. I was invited to participate in a debate with, about affirmative action with uh, uh, some folks who were, you know, just dead set against affirmative action. They had a book that came out. They wanted to discuss the book, they invited me. So, you know, I got up and I said, you know, very happy to be here, but let me ask the following question. So this organization says that it's against affirmative action. It says that it shouldn't, you know, under no circumstances should you take race into account. Was my race taken into account when I was invited here? <laughs> I said, you know, if, 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 if it wasn't, here we, again, this is, this is testable. I'm making the assertion that my race was taken into account. And I bet that one of the ideas was, well, we can't have a, you know, we can't have a, a, a debate that'll be credible if it's a racially homogeneous debate. I mean, we, you know, we got to get, you know, some black person up in here. <laughs> I said, if that wasn't, if, if that was not discussed, you, you can tell me. That they didn't take me up on that. <laughs> so, you know, there has been change. Um, I think that the affirmative action ethos is a deep seated ethos, and that's a good thing. And I think it will continue, again, regardless of what the Supreme Court says. Yes? What do you say to the people who say you substitute class? Mm hmm. Um, the question was, what do I say to the people who say we should substitute class for race? What I say is, number one, we do have a major problem of class inequity in America. 
I mean, it's, it's I mean, the, 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 the um, uh, class inequity is a major problem. And it, it should prompt a major intervention. There are many, many, many poor white people in America who need help. And they should get help. Um, all for it. All for it. But don't do in uh, racial affirmative action. What we need to do is supplement the rather modest interventions we have with interventions that are more substantial. Now, here is one place where I must say I get really angry. In, in debating these things, I mean, people have different views, and I, and I typically really, I, I, I don't get angry. I have, again, I have friends who do, you know, just disagree, but there is one on this one I get angry. Because on this one, I have been in debates with people who, when it's their turn to talk, you know, against racial affirmative action, they say, well, racial affirmative action does not help the truly disadvantaged. It does not help the truly disadvantaged among minority people. It does not help the truly disadvantaged among white people. It does not help the truly disadvantaged. And, you know, and they say, what, what I want is something that will help the truly disadvantaged, and we should just forget about this racial affirmative action because it, it really helps those who, are, who really don't need help. Now, the reason why I get angry is because oftentimes, not always, not always, but often, the people who say that, the only time that they show any solicitude whatsoever to poor people, <laughs> the only time that the idea of poor people even crosses their minds a little bit is to attack racial affirmative action. At no other time do they evince any concern whatsoever about class inequity in America. Only, they use egalitarian rhetoric only to attack racial affirmative action. Now, again, you know, you, you might say, because, again, they're not the only people who attack racial affirmative action on the grounds of a class tilt. There are people who do. There are other people who do, who truly, who are sincerely interested in poor people. And I think that they deserve a response, and I'll give it. So, I mean, I have friends who say, listen, um, why is it, you know, Kennedy, why is it that you spend so much time and effort on racial affirmative action with respect to higher education when it's the case that the people who are benefited are going to do okay anyway. I mean, after all, if, you, if, we, if you're talking about racial affirmative action with respect to a public medical school or a public law school, if you are a plausible candidate to get into a medical school or a law school, what does that mean? That means that you're a college graduate. Not only are you a college graduate, but it means that you are, have done pretty well. You're gonna do okay. And so, you know, there are people who say, instead of spending time and effort on racial affirmative action, you know, protecting a, a policy that helps them, what about the poor kids who don't make it out of high school? What about the poor kids who make it out of high school but are still functionally illiterate? Shouldn't they get more attention? My response is they ought, for sure they should get a lot more attention than they get, but I would again say don't stop racial affirmative action in an effort to help people who really do need help. I think that we need to go down all of these avenues. And I would defend, I would defend my elitism in a way. I mean, if somebody says, Kennedy, you're an elitist because you're so, so focused on higher education and affirmative action there, I would say, okay, fine, you can call me elitist. The fact of the matter is that elite institutions in American society are very, very important. Let me give you a very telling example. The Supreme Court of the United States, very powerful 
organ of government, right? There are nine people on the Supreme Court of the United States. All of the justices on the Supreme Court of the United States went to two schools. There are a lot of wonderful law schools in the United States, in all the different regions of the United States, wonderful law schools. All nine of the justices went to either Harvard Law School or Yale Law School. Um, the elite institutions matter, and that's why it seems to me this issue, it's not the only issue, but it's an important one, and it's an important reason why we ought to be mindful of the need to continue the desegregation of elite institutions in American life. All right. I'll be the first to use the mic okay. as requested. <laughs> um, the problem I have with the opponents of affirmative action, you, and you see it so often, you take a white person who doesn't get that job or that position at the, uh, in the student body of a university, they simply go someplace else and get another either equal or better job. If it's a black person, then that's typically the only shot. So I think when it's almost like the handicap example, when um, a handicapped person takes up a parking slot that's near the entrance, you have grumbling from everyone else. There's only one spot, but the next hundred people say, oh, that handicapped person got my spot. <laughs> mm -hmm. When there's plenty of other places there. So I think what happens is people don't look at the, um, what happened with the uh, person at the University of Texas, where did she go? She probably went to another equally good school. And they don't focus on um, the overall macro environment. And they look at an individual case and they use those examples to attack affirmative action. And I think that needs to be mm -hmm. uh, shown the light for what it really is. Because I don't think that, that has happened. Well, in, in my view, um, one of the things, one of the ways in which we sort of go askew in the affirmative action debate is we do individualize it. We make it seem as though it's about a, a person. We make it seem as though it's about the just desserts of a given person as opposed to another given person. I don't think that's what's going on at all. I think it's about... Um, uh, the, 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 it's, it's not about the just desserts of an individual. It's about what social policy will um, enable us to reach a better place insofar as you know, racial decency is concerned. It's not about you know, Sally or John or Dick. The, the, you know, the, they just happen to be there. Rather, it's about you know, changing an overall culture. Um, that's, it seems to me, that is what seems to me to be the, the important thing. Others? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I promise I'll get back to you, this person. <laughs> uh, thanks. I'll, I'm going to be greedy now and ask two questions. Um, so one, I'd like to go back to the, uh, the question of class-based uh, affirmative action, yeah. uh, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on a hypothet hypothetical example. Um, there's plenty of evidence that black and Latinos uh, are underrepresented in higher education. I, I think there's an equal body of evidence that um, students below the poverty line or below the median household income are even more represented. Uh, and so I'd be curious uh, if you would be a proponent of uh, strong affirmative action for class criteria or rural students or other criteria beyond uh, just race or gender. Uh, and then the second is uh, the last data I saw showed that um, of students starting uh, at four-year institutions, only roughly 60% of them graduated within six years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the argument could be made that um, strong affirmative action by substituting those with a, a less rigorous uh, record um, could have societal harm by lowering the overall number of graduates. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that concern. Okay, two, I can very quickly. First, um, yes, I'm in favor of, I, I, I thought I said before, I'm in favor of interventions to deal with the various inequities in our society. So for, you know, it, um, poor people, whatever, of, of all sorts, are in need of assistance, I'm for that assistance. 
Uh, with respect to your second point about, well, you know, what about evidence showing uh, that people, there's, you know, draw, you know attrition rates or un, it, it takes an undue, you know, un, unduly, uh, people go to colleges and it takes them a long time to graduate. There is a, um, a theory out, it's been out actually throughout the, for, for a long time, the so-called mismatch theory. One of the criticisms of affirmative action is that affirmative action over promotes people. That affirmative action in higher education gets students, um, students are you know, put up here at an institution that is really too difficult for them. And that these students are over promoted they could have gone to maybe a less difficult institution where they would have maybe been in the top of the class or maybe the middle of the class. Instead, they go to a you know, sort of more highly ranked institution and they're in the very bottom of the class. And there's some who say, that's bad. People get discouraged, they drop out. Um, there's mismatch. My response is one, I'm basically in, I'm in, I'm in favor of sensible affirmative action. Can affirmative action be done in a stupid way? Yes. Just like any social policy can be done in a stupid way. So I mean, if you have an affirmative action plan in which you put people in a, you, know, you put people in places in which they are severely underprepared and you make them unduly vulnerable to failure. That's stupid. It might be nicely intentioned, but it's stupid, and I would say, don't do that. Does that happen places? I'm sure it happens places, sure. But um, I don't think that's any reason to condemn affirmative action in principle or to condemn affirmative action as it is characteristically uh, practiced. Others, yes. Sure. Um, so some people claim that actually um, Asian Americans are being very are, are being disadvantaged by uh, affirmative action, and um, because here you have a a, a, um, a racial group that, in a sense, you know, sort of outperforms its percentage. And the idea is, well, I mean, if you're going to, if, if you're going to have, let's, let's suppose you have a hundred places, if you have a spoken or unspoken protocol or calculus in which you're trying to sort of mirror America, what do you do with a group that is rather small, but because the, their kids do really well, won't that limit their, you know, the, the, the potential they have? If you have a, a group that's maybe 5% of the population, but 25% of the valedictorians, won't they be cabin, won't they be limited Visa via affirmative action. This is an issue that's come up with respect to Asian Americans. It's an also an issue that has come up with respect to Jews, historically, with respect to the affirmative action controversy. Um, here's what I say. My response is that one ought to make a very sharp distinction between a policy that works to the disadvantage of a group and one that works invidiously to disadvantage the group. With respect to mere disadvantage, and I say that advisedly, mere disadvantage, that should be left to the political realm. Uh, if people think that that is unfair, if people think that that's not good, you know, affirmative action is imminently changeable by regular politics. The people of California got rid of affirmative action. The people of Michigan got rid of affirmative action. That's regular politics. That's different, however, that's very different than saying that the government has worked invidiously to discriminate against a group. So let me put it a little bit differently. 
if an Asian American kid came to me and said, um, an institution has an affirmative action plan and it worked to my disadvantage, and I don't like that. I didn't get in, it worked to my disadvantage, I don't like that. I'd say, I'm really sorry. I'm sure you worked really hard. Um, life's like that sometimes. I might, you know, and if this person, depending on what this person told me, if this person really got up into my face a whole lot and said something like, and furthermore, Kennedy, you know, uh, you know, I never enslaved your people. <laughs> I never Jim Crowed your people. I'm really, you know, I'm, a, I'm totally against that, but, you know, but don't take it out on me. I might very, you know, you know say, okay, I, I get you, but let me respond and say something back to you. And I say this, you know, with all good feeling. In 1988, the Congress of the United States passed a law in which it did two things. It apologized on behalf of the United States government to the interning of Japanese Americans in World War II. And it also passed a law providing for $20,000 in reparations for people who had been put in those camps. I did not participate in the putting of anybody in the camps. I think I, I'm appalled by it. I think it's terrible. Uncle Sam reached into my pocket via taxes to pay part of the $20,000 reparations. I'm glad Uncle Sam did. I'm glad Uncle Sam did. I'm happy to participate. I'm happy to participate in the rectification of that wrong because I'm part of the United States. I get the benefits of the United States, but because I'm part of the United States, I should also participate in what the United States needs to do in order to get right with things. The United States needs to get right with what was done to Japanese Americans in World War II. No problem with me. I think all Americans should want to get right with the various sorts of inequities we have, including racial inequities. That's what I would say to the person. Thank you, Professor Kennedy. Um, I have a fellowship, and I was recently in an interview, and I was one of the final candidates for an appointment at a federal agency. Mm -hmm. uh, I received an informal email essentially saying, uh, though I was among the top candidates, they were probably going to um, select a veteran because the veteran had, of mm -hmm. course, veteran's preference. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, it was um, a little bit, for me, a little bit frustrating at one point uh, because it wasn't from my qualifications that I was held back. And while well, I'm sure the person who was selected was uh, deserving and had the qualifications for this, and of course, it's hard to get a no. Um, and I talked to uh, you know one of my mentors, and he basically said, well, you know, that's the way it goes sometimes. He said, We've, we have a commitment and we owe it you know, to our veterans. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with him. You know, I, it made a lot of sense. But essentially, he didn't make a legal argument. He made a moral argument that this is something that's right for our country. And I'm wondering if there's other sorts of um, policies that would parallel from yeah. action, either legally or, or morally, that have been used to try to support it in mm -hmm. the courts. Or It's interesting the, the, the case you raise. Um, you know, uh, Many jurisdictions have very strong affirmative action plans for veterans. So where I live in Massachusetts, there is a very strong preference for veterans that has a, uh, um, that disadvantages women in particular. Um, and in fact, there was a, um, one in the Supreme Court, a woman from Massachusetts challenged the strong preference for veterans saying this, you know, this disadvantages me, this disadvantages me, and it has a strong disadvantaging effect on women. The Supreme Court of the United States upheld the veterans' preference, saying, though this has a disadvantaging effect on women, it was not put in place to disadvantage women, therefore, you don't have an equal protection argument. Um, okay, I think that makes sense because after all, you know, you, you, you could go through regular politics and try to change the veterans' preference if you wanted. I think the Supreme Court's ruling on that was, 
in my view, okay. Um, I wish it would pay more attention to its logic uh, when it comes to you know the, the affirmative action dispute. One other thing about the veterans preference thing too, you know, when it was first promulgated, it was very controversial, very controversial. And interestingly enough, uh, people who were against the veterans' preference said many of the same things that people say now with respect to race. But what happens is once something, you know, b b we've lived with it, we've grown used to it, we've sort of accommodated ourselves to it, and when was the last time you heard anybody even talk about the veterans' preference? In fact, nobody even uses the term veterans' preference. It becomes naturalized. Um, with race, however, that has not happened. With race, this issue becomes, you know, it's, it's still a burning issue. Um, it's a burning issue in part because race is different. I mean, the Reconstruction Amendment sound in race. Um, a lot of good people view racial subordination, frankly, different than other sorts of subordination. That's the good side of the story. There is a bad side of the story, however, and I talk about the bad side of the story in my book. As people ask, you know, well, why, you know, why are people against affirmative action? There's certain, there's, some people are against affirmative action for idealistic reasons. I might disagree with them, but there's nonetheless idealistic reasons. Some people are against affirmative action because they perceive affirmative action as advancing the interests of black people, and they are against anything that advances the interests of black people. This coming summer, we will mark the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. If you take a look at the debates about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is just a straight out anti-discrimination provision. If you take a look at it, you will see people, let's call some names, you will see Senator Sam Irvin, you will see other segregationists say, oh, I'm against the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Why? Well, by 1964, they could no longer say what they would have said in 1954. In 1954, they would have been honest and just simply said, you know, black people are inferior and we just don't want them around. By 1964, things had changed, so they came up with something else. What did they come up with in 1964? The 1964 Civil Rights Act will lead to quotas. It will lead to the degradation of our workplaces by putting in place people who are underqualified. It will lead to um, um, it will lead to reverse discrimination against white people. I have a chapter in my book devoted to the history of the idea of reverse discrimination. Many people think that reverse discrimination is an idea that is, that is you know, sort of new, that reverse discrimination came with affirmative action. Not so. I'll give you just one example. The nation's first civil rights law. What was the nation's first federal civil rights law? The nation's first federal civil rights law was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 made all persons born in the United States citizens of the United States. And the Civil Rights Act of 1866 also provided that all persons in the United States would have the same rights as white people to own property, to enter into contracts, to testify, to sue and be sued, the classic civil rights. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 was vetoed by Abraham Lincoln's successor, President Andrew Johnson. President Andrew Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Why? Because he said the Civil Rights Act of 1866 gives, and this is a direct quote, discriminating protection to the Negro, end quote. Slavery was less than a year, the abolition of slavery was yes, less than a year old, and he was, he, the idea of reverse discrimination was already abroad. He said, you know, the federal government's never done anything like this on behalf of our people. Why is it being done on behalf of these people? Now, of course, our people had never been enslaved, but I guess he forgot that. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, I was very struck by one comment in your book to begin with, which was that 
all medications have side effects. But, but what? All, all medications mm -hmm. have side effects. Yeah. But it's not because a medication has a side effect that you don't take it. Mm -hmm. If the net effect is positive, you do. First point. And I, th I think that's a very striking point, not stated in terms of cost-benefit analysis. Okay. Right? But I think that the, the, the current debate is, seems to me is very locked into a discussion which is, either, which is primarily legal. But it seems to me that a different tack might have some potential for opening the debate up. And that debate was, for me, uh, well captured in an article in the New York Times, no, the, the, the HT, the Herald Tribune, a couple of weeks ago, which pointed out that 30% of places in institutions of higher learnings, and in particular the top ones, are legacy places. Who is to say that all of those people who are admitted on legacy places are more or less competent than those who are excluded? Who is to say that some of those people are not over-promoted, for want of a better word, by birthright? So this, it seems to me, is an avenue that could be explored, which represents a kind of melding of law and other social yeah. consequences. And finally, I'd like to point out that uh, there is a place in Oxford, which I think you know well, and I do too, which said that we don't take you for what you are b because of what you've done now. We take you for what you might become in the future. And our judgment is that you, okay, have potential that merits that special treatment, even though at this point in time, you may not be the most technically qualified. Well, I think those are all very good points. On the legacy point, there are people who are really trying to um, attack social inequity in higher education using legacies uh, as the way of getting at it. The problem is, the, the problem they've confronted is, and when you say, you know, this is a legal matter, the fact, you know, um, for good and for bad, um, legal doctrine is very important in American life. And um, one of the problems that people have had in trying to use the legacy to try to get at this is, as a legal matter, there's nothing wrong with legacies. As a legal matter, there's nothing wrong, frankly, with class inequity. In fact, class inequity, in the eyes of many people, is the American way. Uh, and so, you know, people are searching for ways to get at this, but thus far they've been, you know, they, they, they haven't been able to get much traction. You all have been very patient. Thank you very much.